I jumped to 1604. That's 34 years later, July 7th. There's a brief, which is another short document, by Pope Clement VIII, Cum Sanctissimum, which is found also at the beginning of missiles. And when you read this, you say, hmm, it didn't go so smooth after, after all. <clears throat> Let me read this. It's a beautiful text, and it's, it is so Catholic. You know, you read this, and you vibrate as you hear it, because this is, this is uh, our mother talking. We're used to this kind of, of language compared to what we hear today. Okay. So, cum sanctissimum by Pope Clement VIII. Since the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist, by means of which Christ our Lord has made us partakers of his sacred body and ordained to stay with us unto the consummation of the world, is the greatest of all the sacraments, and is, it is accomplished in the Holy Mass and offered to God the Father for the sins of all the people, it is highly fitting that we who are in one body, which is the church, and who share of the one body of Christ, should use in this ineffable and awe-inspiring sacrifice the same manner of celebration and the same ceremonial observance and rite. The church is one. The worship should be one. And the, sac the Holy Eucharist, the Most Holy Sacrament, it should be, you know, the f our first concern is that one worship. First paragraph. Listen to this here. Not only have the Roman pontiffs, our predecessors, always desired and for a long time greatly striven to achieve this aim, but above all, Pope Pius V of happy memory undertook, in accordance with the decree of the Council of Trent, to bring the Roman Missal into conformity with the old and purer pattern. That's what Pius V did. And to have it printed in, uh, in Rome. So what we want to do, Pius V did. Although he very severely forbade under many penalties that anything should be added to it or that anything for any reason be removed from it, Nevertheless, in the course of time, this is only 34 years, in the course of time, it has come to pass that through the rashness and boldness of the printers or of others, many errors have crept into the missiles which have been produced in recent years. See, the problem with printers, if you're a printer, you better watch out. <clears throat> What did the printer do? Don't forget, this, this is 1600. <clears throat> um, I go back. Protestantism spread its errors. How? Through falsification of the Bible. Scripture is going to be a key element. And by the way, in, in, with the new mass, the very first thing when they, the Catholics, when Bugini, Bugnini was preparing the new mass, and he consulted Protestant uh, experts. The first point that was uh, worked on was the readings, was the Bible in the New Mass. So, so many errors have crept into the missiles. <clears throat> and w what part of the missile has been tampered with? The readings scripture. That very old Latin version of the Holy Bible, which even before St. Jerome's time was held in honor in the church, that's called, what's the name of the, the version of St. Jerome? The Vulgate. But that was not the first Latin Bible. There was an edition before that, you know? It's called the Itala. The Itala was the old Italian, uh, it's Latin actually, but it's called the Itala. And uh, sometimes when you know the Vulgate, it happens to us because we read the Vulgate in Latin, 
And then you say mass, and you realize, because you have the formulas in your head, you realize oh, this is different, slightly different, because these introit or gradual or alleluias predates St. Jerome. They're older than, St. Jerome is about 400. Okay, so that's what he's saying here. That very old version, which even before St. Jerome's time was held in honor in the church, and from which almost all the introits, graduals, and offertories of the Mass had been taken. So the old Itala version, the Pope is saying, has been entirely removed. The texts of the Epistles and Gospels, which hitherto were read during the celebration of the Mass, have been disturbed in many places. Different and utterly unusual beginnings have been prefixed to the gospel text. And finally, many things have been here and there arbitrarily altered. So the Pope is saying, although Pius V said, this is the way Mass is going to be said, it's chaotic. They're not following what the Pope said. Particularly in these parts taken from the scripture. All these changes seem to have been introduced under the pretext of conforming everything to the standard of the Vulgate edition of Holy Writ, as if it were allowable to anyone to do so on his own authority <clears throat> without the advice of the Apostolic See. You cannot change the missile by your, on your own, on, by your own name. Okay? Having considered these innovations in our pastoral solicitude, which induces us to earnestly protect and preserve in everything, and especially in the sacred rites of the church, the best and old norm. We have ordered in the first place that the above-mentioned printed missiles, so corrupted, be banned and declared null and void, and that their use be disallowed in the celebration of the Mass, unless they be entirely and in everything amended according to the original text published under Pius V. That's what a pope will have to do one day. When a pope wants to restore the liturgy, he's going to have to say all the Novus Ordo missiles to the, to the bin. Okay? Get rid of them and take, take these books. That, the pope is saying this in 1604. Not the Novus Ordo, but they had just changed the readings and the scriptural parts. <clears throat> we have also entrusted some of our venerable brethren cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, versed in the Holy Scripture and skilled in ecclesiastical antiquity, with the business of restoring the Missal to its primitive and purest form. They didn't have far to go. 1604, they just had to go to 1570. But already, Missals were circulating, which were not faithful to Pius V. In their loyalty to us and in their piety and devotion to the Church, these cardinals employing also their other learned men trained in ecclesiastical scholarship and having searched for and diligently examined old missals and other books bearing upon the subject have endeavored to restore the Roman Missal to its original purity and to confirm and attest the painstaking care and diligence of Pius V and those appointed by him. So Pius V went back to St. Gregory, here Clement VIII, 1604, went back to Pius V. Finally, okay, so it's getting better, is it? 1634, 30 years later, Pope Urban VIII, the brief sequit est, which is also found at the beginning of the altar missiles. I'm going to skip a little bit here. He starts about the same thing. The Mass is the, the most important uh, part of the church. Okay, uh, we have to give all the due worship and reverence and be ever on, on our guard lest the negligence offend the angels who vie with them in eager adoration. It's beautiful. Negligence in the worship scandalize the angels. It's beautiful. In view of this consideration, listen to this. Following in the footsteps of the Supreme Pontiffs, our predecessors, Pius V, 1570, and Clement VIII, 1604, who
who undertook to review and restore most diligently the right and prayers pertaining to the celebration, celebration of this sacred mystery, we have ordered that these be again examined and that if by chance anything, as often happens, has been corrupted in the course of time, it's only 30 years now, it shall be restored to its former standard. The rubrics which had been allowed to gradually degenerate from the old usage and right have been restored to their former pattern. Those which did not seem to be easily intelligible to the readers have been more clearly stated. And moreover, having compared the pertinent text with the Vulgate edition of Holy Writ, the differences which have crept into the Missal have been amended according to this standard and norm. So, then he speaks about the printers. So, and he says here, this document, this brief, must be printed always at the beginning or at the end of every missal. A reminder to all the priests, bishops, cardinals, that, you know, keep the tradition. And notice, you know, what is clear in the mind of these popes is always restore tradition which has been tra tampered with. It's always that. It's always this, this worship, this attention, this diligence, this uh, reverence for worship, for the, the liturgy which has been handed down. And at all the time, you see, this is 1634, 1604, 1570. There's always priests and bishops and monks who say, oh, I can do better. I can improve on this. It's not a question of improving. It's a question of worshiping God according to what the church tells us. And we jump, 1634, this time we jump to St. Pius X. Six, uh, 1911. The Apostolic Constitution Divino Aflatu. Now, this constitution is essentially on the Roman breviary. The first line, okay? <clears throat> Our predecessors, St. Pius V, Clement VIII, Urban VIII, on revising the Roman breviary religiously kept this law. Which law? the heritage of our fathers. So, what affects the missile affects the breviary. There's, because we have the same saints, the same Sundays, the same liturgical year, both at the altar and in our breviary. So these two have to work together. St. Pius V says, you know, St. Pius X gives a, a principle here which, is, which has occurred frequently in the history of the church. And thank God there are many saints in the church. And thank God many are canonized saints. And the popes will canonize real saints, okay? <clears throat> but when you canonize a saint especially a great saint like St. Therese of the Child Jesus or Don Bosco or St. Vincent de Paul, of course you want to give them a slot in the calendar. But there's only 365 days in the year. So here we're going to have a problem. It happens regularly that the calendar gets overcrowded because we cannot add days to the calendar. There's only 365 days. So what happens is sometimes the popes will, I mean, the pope will do a certain number of saints. He will add their saints, the feast, to, to the calendar. It may not be for the universal church. It might be for a particular country, a particular diocese, Brother Andre in Montreal, these kind of things. But there's so many saints, and people want to, work, to venerate their saints, that sometimes the Feast of the Saints takes over the Sunday. 
you'll have the feast of a saint on the Sunday. And the saint will take over what we call the sanctoral, which is the cycle of the saints, will take over the temporal, which is the liturgical year, Advent, Christmas, and so on. So there's these two. And what happened is St. Pius X says, uh, here he says, in their honor, the offices of the saints were by degrees multiplied so much so that the offices of Sunday and Ferials were hardly recited any longer. So the sanctuary takes over the tempora. And St. Pius X says, that's not right because the tempora, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, is our Lord. The sanctuary is a servant of the king. So the king should still have the first place. And so Sundays in our first class, there's different degrees of classes. And so and St. Pius X reordered the breviary, the calendar, and certain rubrics to make sure that the, uh, the saints would not hide our Lord, so to speak. And... Uh, so that was a big thing he did on the calendar. St. Pius X also uh, made a revision of the Gregorian chant, which had been corrupted over the centuries, especially since the 1400s, 1500s. Uh, so, and d normally this apostolic constitution is found. I checked the missile this morning. It was not there, but in the old missiles, uh, you would find this also because it affects certain rubrics of the mass, certain masses, okay? So, Michael Davies says, like the reforms of Pope Clement VIII, what year? Clement VIII is 04, Urban VIII, 34, Pius V, 1570, Pius V, 1570, okay? So he says, <clears throat> the reform of St. Pius X can be seen as an extension of the reform of St. Pius V. So, but no, well, one thing I want you to understand is that although St. Pius V decreed everything he decreed, you can see was not always followed, and what other popes have done is use, it's not in the prayers of the Mass, the offertory, the canon, all these prayers. It's usually the rubrics. <clears throat> it's how to say the Mass, although under Protestantism, some of the prayers had been introduced as well, which were not uh, Catholic. So they've been removed. Uh, question of octaves. You have in the old, even under St. Pius X, you have quite a number of saints who have an octave. This saint is so great that we're going to celebrate him for eight days. So you'll have, but what happens sometimes is that you have many saints that come one after the other, and you have many octaves which are going together after Christmas in the old, old uh, breviary and missal. You have Christmas has an octave. But then you have, uh, I think St. Stephen has an octave, St. John has it, John Evander, the 26th has an octave, the 27th has an octave, I think the only Holy Innocent as well. So you have three or four octaves going simultaneously, although only the eighth day will be recalled, remembered, okay? But it gets pretty intense, okay? So some popes have suppressed the octave, to highlight the temporal, like it's Christmas, it's Epiphany, it's Easter. Our Lord has the first place always, okay, so. Now, just to finish, Pius XII <coughs> made some changes in the, in the Holy Week <coughs> in 1955. 
He simplified the Holy Week. And uh, so this, he did not touch the doctrine. He changed what we call the rubrics, how to celebrate. There was some, some simplification in 55. And he had prepared also a, a simplification of the rubrics, uh, but he died before it came out. And it came out under Pope John XXIII in 1960. Novum Rubricarum, July 25, 1960. But Archbishop Lefebvre told us what came out under John XXIII was actually the work of Pius XII, which he had worked on, because these things take time and years. Like the canon law was done by Pius X, but it came out under Benedict XV. And in 1962, the name of St. Joseph was added to the canon by John XXIII. Now, something about that detail, the adding of the name of St. Joseph to the canon. Does that go against Pius V? Okay. We have in a cone a little document which was a petition made to Pope Leo XIII in uh, 18, I think, 94. I have a copy of it. I didn't have time to, to print it. This petition, uh, following the, uh, the, prom the, uh, the growing devotion to St. Joseph, Saint, the devotion to St. Joseph got a big expansion under Pius IX, and it continued to expand in the 1880s, 1890s. And, and so a petition was made to Pope Leo XIII to give more honor to St. Joseph. They, they were calling this, you know, you have, if you know your catechism a little bit, okay, the worship given to God is called dulia. Duli, okay, Dulia. The worship given to our, the veneration to Our Lady is, is hyperdulia. She's the first, okay? And they were bringing now a special category for St. Joseph, who was the closest to Our Lord and to Our Lady, primo dulia. So, like the, the next one. In that document, they were asking to insert the name of St. Joseph in the confiteor. Uh, if I recall, there was three things. They were in the, uh, the Libera, in the canon, as we have it uh, now. In the Libera, after the Our Father, Libera knows, there were three or four places in the Mass which, uh, and also which were suggested to the Pope. And this petition was signed by 800 bishops and cardinals, 800, and you have the list there in the document, and one of them is Cardinal Sarto, Pius X. He says, fine, there's no problem. You might say, well, his name was Joseph, <laughs> Giuseppe Sarto, okay? He had a great devotion to St. Joseph as well. But, but the, the point is very important, okay? Cardinal Sarto, future St. Pius X, saw nothing wrong in adding the name of St. Joseph to the Confiteor, to the Canon, to the Liberanos, and I think to another place. So it's important. And now, then he became Pope, and he did not do it. There's different interpretation of this, but from knowing Pius X and knowing you know, his, his writings as a pope, it is pretty clear that he did not do it, be, not because it was wrong in itself, because he signed it a few, 10 years before he agreed, but because as pope he saw the state of the church worldwide and how modernism had entered the church, 
And he said, it's not the time to do these things which, even if they're good in themselves, are not good at this moment. Because modernism is a changing Christianity. And everything is changing. And so although he had this tremendous devotion to St. Joseph, he says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So John XXIII did it. So I want you to understand. So in itself, there's nothing wrong because you have 100 years before they, they were asking for it, but, or 70 years before. But it was certainly the wrong timing to do so because they were touching the canon, which had not been touched, actually, not just since St. Since Pius V, but since St. Gregory the Great in 600. Okay. Uh, so it's a question of prudence. And... Um, so, Archbishop Lefebvre told us, and that's what you know, we follow, uh, he says, these rubrics, so the way of saying mass, according to 1960, 61, where usually we say 62, the 62 missile, that's what you have, the Angelus missile, 1962, okay, is the last acceptable uh, missile before Vatican II, okay, which is perfectly Catholic. It's a little bit simplified according to the rubrics, according to octaves, according to certain uh, feasts, compared to Pius X. But he, St. Pius X himself, had simplified things compared to previous popes, okay? And so Archbishop Lefebvre says, well, and the pope has the right to do that. R-I-G-H-T, has the right to do that. And so <clears throat> what happened after Vatican II is a completely different ballgame. Here they touch the whole mass, the offertory, the canon, the, the, the way of saying mass, and they, they change the doctrine. But what these popes have done, here Michael Davies says, subsequent <clears throat> papal reforms up to 1960, subsequent means after St. Pius V, consisting, consisted of restoring the Missal to the form promulgated by St. Pius V, adding new propers, so new Feast of Saints, amending the rubrics, the calendar in particular, improving the musical notation or translation of the Psalms, and a simplification and rationalization of the Holy Week ceremonies. So, Nothing substantial like the new mass did. Rubric, usually rubric, calendar, okay, reforms. Uh, novum rubricarum. That's John the 23rd. <clears throat> novum rubricarum, July 25, 1960. So, uh, the new body of rubrics of the Roman breviary and missal is approved. So, and that's part of our formation, you know, because a lot of, a lot of people go to traditional mass not knowing the history of the liturgy, you know, think that if you change one word from the time of St. Pius V, you're excommunicated. I say, sorry, I mean, popes have made some changes after St. Pius V. The popes, they were not excommunicated. They are the level of rubrics, level of, they changed and made some, some slight changes. So, on the, the calendar, on the rubrics, as I told you here. So, but not on the ordinary of the mass. Usually it's something external or the calendar, uh, temporal, sanctoral, that's where the changes are. And that's our mass. So, and that's what we want to keep. And uh, there's the mind of the church. The danger, and I think, you know, our spiritual Lefebvre principle is, is sound because he says, 
As Catholic, we have to submit to the Roman Church. That's our Catholicism. The moment you start saying, well, I prefer the pre-1955 Holy Week, this, this year, Rome has allowed Ecclesia Dei groups like Fraternity of St. Peter and Good Shepherd to use the pre-1955 rubrics. We are not using them, okay? Because you have to understand the big picture. The big picture is that Rome doesn't really care. Cardinal Castro Mayer once said, he was talking about ordinations, traditional ordination. He says, all this is folklore. You like medieval vestments, you like these, fine, as long as you accept Vatican II. And so they don't care as long as you accept the council and the new mass. Okay. So Archbishop Lefebvre said the last sound official missile and the missile, the breviary, the ritual, the pontifical, the martyrology, the five books, is 1962. If you, and we have lots of priests today, city of Acantis, and a lot of priests who say, well, let's go back to pre-55. But we ask the question, by what authority are you doing this? Oh, I prefer that. So that's your personal authority. I prefer the breviary of St. Pius X. I prefer, to, why stop at Pius X? Why don't you go to Leo XIII? Why don't you go to Pius V? Who decides? And that's, and that's where Archbishop Lefebvre is truly Catholic in the sense that the church is asking me this. The authority is the authority of the church. It's not my own preference. Because if I say, choose my own preferences, then your preference might be different, and so we lose the source of unity. And that's very important. And as I showed to you, I tried that, uh, uh, I mean, there's been, you know, tradition has been kept up to just before the council. <clears throat> After that, there was a breach of tradition. So we will see next time. Next time, I would like to change a little bit the subject, the symbolism of the Mass. And then a subsequent conference, we will come back to Pius the Fifth and look at it from the legal point of view. And Pius the Fifth and the new mass, comparing the two at the uh, legitimacy of Quo Primum and the legitimacy of the missile of Paul the Sixth.